parasailing can be exciting, and yet it's fairly safe. You can find parasailing vendors on many lakes and coastal areas. It's a lot of fun and easy to do. They put you on a boat, hook you up to a harness, and take you on up. And great views, too. I went zip lining in Puerto Rico. There are also some great views, but it's hard to find some folks that do zip lining here in the U.S. If you Google sailplaning in your area, you'll find some clubs that'll uh, take you up sailplaning. The, the cost is minimal. The adventure is high. These guys know what they're doing. It's fairly safe, yet it feels like it's really dangerous. So it's really high in the fun factor. Snow skiing is a great option for people that love the great outdoors. Whether you have a mobility impairment or you're blind, you could still enjoy snow skiing. I did skiing in Santa Fe, New Mexico. If you want to go skiing somewhere, you've got to call ahead, though, to make arrangements. You've got to make sure you're paired up with a ski buddy. You'll enjoy it. I know I did. Cliff climbing is also a great sport. And if you're not living on the edge, you're taking up too much space. That's why I went to Socorro, New Mexico. This cliff was about 110 feet high. And yes, I did go all the way to the top. It'll be tough to find someone in your area to do this, but it's worth the effort. I went bungee jumping from this 220 foot high bridge in South Africa. Bungee jumping is actually safer than it looks. Since you're on a bungee cord, it slowly stops you and then gradually brings you back up. While in South Africa, you might want to try bridge swinging. Yeah, this was a lot of fun. And I always had the comfort of knowing if the line broke, I'd have about two feet of water to break my fall. Man, was that nice to know. Skydiving. If at first you don't succeed, skydiving probably isn't for you. The third time I went skydiving was with our good friends at Skydive San Marcos. Here I am in my jumpsuit getting ready to board the plane. These guys just lifted me out of my chair and into the plane. They had great videographers there as well. They did a bang up job. You could tell some of us had just a little bit too much chamomile tea. These are mostly accountants and librarians you see on this plane. They're wrapping a strap around my leg and the instructor's leg. This will just make it safer on landing so my leg won't absorb any impact. Boy, everybody here's got to be a critic, huh? Never satisfied. There we go. Now we're ready. Oh, what a beautiful view there, huh? The videographer had stepped out onto the outside of the plane. And I'm getting ready to jump. Two, three, here we go. Hey, look! Someone pushed Tom Cruise out of the plane. That's not Tom Cruise. That's Antonio Banderas. Head out on the highway. Looking for adventure. 
Yeah, that was a lot of fun. He's trying to get me to hold my head up for the camera, but I can't bend my neck back. Here we go, having a little bit of fun here. That line you see from the instructor's back is connected to a drogue chute. It just helps stabilize us in flight a little. Now he pulls the main chute. Whoa, where do we go? Here I come, somebody catch me. Every day. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, baby. Yeah. I went sailing aboard a fully accessible tall ship called the Tenacious. Its home port is in Portsmouth, England. Of course, it had all the accessible amenities. It had to have an elevator, because those steps were just too darn steep to climb. You'd expect an elevator, but there are many amenities that you'd be surprised to find aboard a tall ship. For example, in the bathroom, the sinks are fully accessible. You can move them any way for your own personal comfort. You can move them sideways or you can move them up and down whichever position is most comfortable and accessible to you everyone works on the ship I took my turn manning the helm this was fully accessible to me Anyone with a disability can man the helm, including my friend Herb, who is completely blind. He uses a talking compass. When Herb's not manning the helm, he's up in the sails, up on the yards. He's fearless. When I'm not working, I like to spend my time on the bowsprit. It's a lovely view up there and a great ride. Everyone does take their turn working though, and there's plenty to be done aboard a ship. Usually there are lines to be hauled or simply tied up. And of course, Cleaning's an everyday chore. Everything's got to be cleaned. And then cleaned again. With calm seas and fair winds, we take turns going up to the crow's nest. This is quite a haul. But sailors know how to handle lines. And I have no fear, they know what they're doing. They haul me all the way up to the crow's nest here, so I can get a view of what the other sailors see. And believe me, that's quite a view. This ship has better access than many buildings I've been in.
Sometimes we would dock near some island and need to take a Zodiac from the ship to go to that island. And that's when it was time to go over the edge. These sailors know how to handle ropes, or in their parlance, lines. And they can get us up the mast or over the side with ease. Access was paramount in the mind of the designers of this accessible tall ship, the Tenacious. The Lord Nelson is another accessible sailing ship out of the UK. Once we're loaded up into the Zodiac, it's over to the island we go. And what a beautiful trip that is. Getting out of the Zodiacs at the island is easy. Once we're on the island, we'll go up to Indian River. This is on the island of Dominica, and the scenes are breathtaking here as well. The rowboats have removable seats in them. They take the planks for the seats out and lower us folks in wheelchairs in. Once we get to our destination, they simply lift us up out of the rowboats and on to shore. From there, we'll go searching for another adventure. And hard to believe, but in the middle of this jungle, we will find a bar, a place to have a a few few drinks, do a little bit of dancing, and just relax. And when we're done at the bar, it's back to the ship, back to the Zodiacs, and back to the Tenacious. It's a great time. If you'd like to go sailing on an accessible tall ship, go to www.jst.org slash UK. You'll be glad you did. If you prefer smaller boats, this catamaran might be the one for you. They're a lot smaller than a tall ship, a bit faster and a lot more exciting, but accessibility might be a concern. Getting on them can be quite difficult. But as long as you've got a couple hearty hands to help you out, you may be all right. Sailing is always a matter of logistics. These sailboats weren't designed for people in wheelchairs. But once we're in place, we're ready to go. They just need to back me up now so the chair doesn't flip backwards once we hit the waves. This was in Roatan, Honduras, after we went scuba diving. Sun, sand, surf. Oh, this is the life for me. Now, is that fun or what? I love the ocean breezes, the, uh, just the smell and the taste of the ocean air is really refreshing for me. I could be sailing out all day and never miss the land. If you get a small group of people together, you can rent a catamaran like this for a fairly affordable amount. We got some folks from the scuba club together, put our money together, and we had this for the day. This ship is the adventure. A friend of mine, Trevor Jones, built this accessible sailing ship. 
here I am off the coast of the United Kingdom, enjoying the breeze again. It's a bit overcast today, but you can see the airfoils. These are like airplane wings turned on their side. And Trevor can use, can control these with a computer so he can steer the ship all by himself, even though he's a wheelchair user. I put these sea legs on the back of my chair to keep from flipping over once we hit the waves. They've helped out a number of times in many situations. Scuba diving with the Eels on Wheels Scuba Club in Austin, Texas. Here's Davin pushing me down the boardwalk there to get on the boats to go out uh, diving. The guys are lifting me uh, into the boat here. Just a small step there. There we go, guys. Good job. All right, let's get positioned here somewhere where I won't flip over when the boat starts rolling. Uh, Sonia's going to buckle me in there. Got some valuable cargo here. She wouldn't want to lose me. Hey, who can blame her? I'm a, I'm a pretty good catch, huh? There she goes. She gives the uh, OK sign, and we're ready to get moving there. Davin's helping me with my uh, wetsuit on. It can, be, it can be tough getting on, but uh, this one's custom made for me. They've got me on the back of the boat now. They're going to put uh, a weight belt on me. They're going to start by uh, putting it around my waist, which is how most divers wear their belts, but mine tend to slip off there. So we're going to make a slight modification on this. Uh, we're going to get another weight belt, and we're going to hook it over my shoulder to hold this uh, weight belt, waist weight belt on me. Here we go, slipping that other belt on. Of course, nowadays we would just use a harness made for this type of thing, but uh, it wasn't available to me at the time, so we had to improvise. And you'll find that's what a lot of folks do uh, in my position. They'll improvise. To, uh, to get the things that they need to go diving. They have me on the transom now. That's Chad in front of me in the black dive suit. Uh, they've got me comfortably on the edge there. They're going to put the BCD, the buoyancy compensator device on me. It's filled with air. Um, got my mask on and the regulators in my mouth. They just nudge me forward and here I go, plop into the water. Devin spins me around. And here we're just letting the guys know that everything's okay. And I'm, uh, I'm just about ready to go diving. So um, we'll say so long to these guys. I'm wearing ankle weights so I can float straight up and down. It's easier to clear my mask and breathe. There we go. Davin's taking me down. Look at that clear blue water. Isn't that something, huh? Beautiful sight. Other folks are down before us. Davin's taking me down slowly. Checking me from time to time, make sure I'm not signaling that I need to clear my ears. Uh, if I did, he would assist me with that. Oh, well, there's some fish there, huh? Oh, and there's a, a divasaurus. I believe that's Jill waiting for us. She's going to be another dive buddy. Devin is pretty in tune with what I like to see, whether it be caves or swim throughs or uh, just coral walls. Uh, so he's going to take me to some of these places. He's familiar with this area. Oh, there's another great shot. Oh, look at how clear that water is. I love diving at Cayman Brack. Well, I just love being underwater. There's there's nothing like diving. It's just a great experience. It, it's like being in a totally different world, really indescribable. You'll just have to try it yourself, uh, see how you like it. For me, um, I really enjoy it. Uh, I'm, I'm sure you will as well. Here we are, here you see another shot of Jill. And uh, of course I'm out in front, I'm pulling them along. I'm always doing all the work. We're close to the uh, sea floor now, just uh, exploring some walls. Oh, here's a friendly little fellow. The, the dive master here is encouraging him to come closer so I can get a better view of him. Uh, we don't want to touch the sea creatures, actually. Um, we're intruding on them, they're not intruding on us. So uh, be respectful of that. We'll leave this little guy alone. Sometimes I like to float by myself. I can control my buoyancy to go up or down by inhaling or exhaling. 
Uh, however, there wasn't quite enough air in my buoyancy compensator device to allow me to float the way I wanted to. Now, uh, Jill's going to pick me up here because she uh, wants to protect the seafloor. The seafloor is a living organism. We don't want to damage it, so let's be mindful to stay off of the seafloor. When the dive is over, and it's always over too soon, uh, they get me to the surface. They're going to take the uh, weights off me first, and they'll take the uh, tank and the BCD off of me uh, last. Here I am at the surface. They're going to get me over to the back of the boat, being mindful not to hit my head on the uh, back of the boat here. There you go. They've got me up on the back of the boat. It came in brackets. It's fairly easy to get in and out of these boats. That's why we love diving there so much. Now they're going to carry me to my wheelchair. It's a good thing I'm a lightweight, huh? Otherwise, these guys would be straining themselves. And once they get me in a wheelchair, they might as well remove these goggles. I have no use for them on... Uh, on the boat here. Let's get rid of that strap as well. Let's wash the face off, get that salt off. Ah, that feels great. You know, communication underwater is very important. Dive buddies have to learn what each other needs to do, either to be more comfortable or to be safe underwater. I developed a method for people to communicate underwater. This is especially important for a person like myself. They can't use my hands. If you want to learn more about this method, go to my webpage www.genosplace.org and download the story, The Urge to Submerge. It'll explain a little bit more about that method. In 2003, the Coalition of Texans with Disability organized an expedition of a group of people with disabilities to go to Mount Everest base camp. That was a terrific adventure there. That's one form of organized recreation you'll rarely see. But if you can, can become part of a team to do this type of expedition, you'll love it. Much of the time I wasn't in a, wheel, in a wheelchair like I am here being carried up these steps in Nepal. Much of the time I was being carried on the back of a Sherpa in a bamboo basket called a doko, as you see here. The terrain was just way too tough to use the wheelchair. As you can see, I had to stay bundled up to stay warm. It was an experience of a lifetime, and I'll never forget it. Way to go, Coalition of Texans with Disabilities, and way to go to all my teammates on that expedition. I've wanted to go paragliding ever since I saw folks do it on TV. So I packed up the old wheelchair Conestoga and headed out to Switzerland. I went paragliding twice with our good friends at the Alpine Center. The first time I went with Peter and the second time with Stefan. In fact, I liked it so much I wrote a story about it. I posted it on my webpage. It's called Wind Riders of the Alps and it's on www genosplace.org. Feel free to download it. Here we are in Interlaken, Switzerland. There's uh, Dino on the left, uh, Peter in front of me, and Stefan on the right of your screen there, getting me hooked up in a harness. You can see my chair in the background. We took the wheels off of it. Uh, if we hadn't done that, that chair would easily have rolled downhill. Now here's a view through my Adventure Cam 2 from Biosports. This is a fantastic little camera. Uh, I mounted it on my helmet, and so you'll be seeing what I see, or I should say what I saw when I went paragliding. Uh, they're getting me all set up on a hill, getting ready for takeoff. We actually spent some uh, time there getting ready, uh, perhaps 10 minutes or so, just making sure the harness was on uh, 
properly, uh, making sure all the lines uh, weren't tangled and weren't tangled and uh, were in good working order. Uh, there's Dino on the right. Um, he's telling Lawrence, "Oh, you better move, better move from there." So Lawrence picks up the camera and he's about to move, but uh, no worries, I've still got my adventure cam on and and uh, we'll get a good view here. So the guys are picking me up here. Um, I'm strapped in a tandem harness to Peter while uh, Stefan and Dino hold me up here. They're going to take a few steps here and uh, that paraglider just fills up with air right away. A few more steps and uh, we're airborne. We're up and away. Here's a view through the uh, Adventure Cam 2 from Viosports. Oh yeah, free as a bird, here we go. A better view through the uh, Adventure Cam. Uh, great little camera, I love it. We're making some turns in the air. You can see we're not really losing much elevation. We just keep making these gentle turns. Uh, Peter found some good thermals to keep us up there for a while. Here's a view again through the Adventure Cam 2. Here we go, turning again. We just kept making some uh, turns over and over again, staying up as long as we could. Here we go, turning again. Uh, we made it. We made quite a number of turns, but it was a good day. We had good thermals, so we were able to stay up quite a while. Here's a picture of me and Peter. Peter took fifth place in world competition in paragliding, the same year that uh, I went to Interlaken. Here you can see the beautiful blue waters of the glacier-fed rivers in Interlaken. They have all sorts of uh, paragliders from beginning and novice to uh, expert class. Now the, the ones we were in were pretty stable, but uh, when Peter and Stefan are, are flying in competition, they take uh, paragliders that are inherently very unstable. And the reason for that is they're a lot better for acrobatics. They can do all sorts of turns in them, uh, all sorts of maneuvers very easily. Here's a picture of Stefan and myself. Stefan holds a world paragliding record of staying up for eight hours and traveling a distance of 197 kilometers. The whole staff there at, at the Alpine Center were great. Uh, I also went paragliding in Brazil. Here we are in Rio de Janeiro. That's my pilot, Daniel. We had a really short takeoff to get off this mountain. Uh, Daniel did a good job getting us off the ground there. Beautiful view. You can see Daniel patting me on the shoulder here, uh, trying to make sure I'm comfortable. The Brazilian people seem real sensitive this way. I was so surprised that he was so happy to be able to take me paragliding. The views here were just phenomenal. We didn't stay up in the air that long, perhaps uh, seven minutes or so, but um, still it was, it was long enough to get a f sense of what paragliding is like, to feel the, uh, the wind, It was very nice. Again, Daniel is patting me on the shoulder, wanting to make sure I'm comfortable. He, he grabs my hands here to see if I can reach up and uh, perhaps steer the uh, paraglider myself, as they sometimes do with uh, uh, passengers but I, I really can't reach up that high. 
and there's there's no way I can uh, grip the cord to steer this paraglider but uh, I do appreciate the effort of him uh, wanting me uh, to actually participate in the sport. Hi everybody, I'm in Brazil. Here you see the uh, beach and this is going to be our landing zone, our landing strip. Daniel's going to go ahead and focus on this, bring us down a bit. Um, it, it's just such a wonderful feeling being so high up, and yet it's such a, a sense of freedom being able to move in a, a three dimensional space with ease. Here we're getting a, a bit close to some uh, hotels or apartment buildings, and I mean real close. And we're going to turn around now and begin our uh, approach to the beach to land. Here we go, Daniel's turning us around now. We're coming down, coming down. And luckily this sand is gonna be soft. Boom, that was easy and fun. What a great time. I've traveled in 43 countries and find traveling to be great recreation. Whether I'm going through the jungles of West Africa or perhaps getting into a long tail boat in Thailand. As you can see, I took the wheels off my chair to get into this boat. I often take the wheels off of my chair to get into uh, boats or uh, other forms of transportation. I, I need to stay in my chair for trunk balance. Here I am on top of an elephant with my friend Davin. As you can see, I'm also in my wheelchair in this shot and once again took the wheels off. Whether you're traveling by train in Europe or perhaps taking a cruise with a friend, there's all sorts of travel adventures that await you. You never know what you're going to find. And you meet all kinds of great people. I found this uh, stair descender in Japan. Wow, what a trip that was. Pretty amazing. I even found myself on a Chinese junk in Africa and on this bridge in Costa Rica. Whenever you go looking for adventure, you'll find it somewhere. Even if it's just on a lake in Ohio, getting onto a raft with some friends. Or perhaps you prefer to play with the dolphins in Honduras. Or watch the floating market in Thailand. Traveling on the flying bridge of a boat or through the jungle of Costa Rica on a telefetico is a lot of fun. This jungle river boat was great fun as well. And this three-wheeler in the Philippines. I enjoyed Peru. I hired these two guys to haul me around. And my friend Lawrence went with me to Petra in Jordan and to Egypt as well. 
whether you're sailing on a tall ship or going up the stairs in Venice, perhaps visiting a fort in Puerto Rico and taking a long ramp up the fort just to enjoy the view. You meet all kinds of people and you'll have some of the best time of your life traveling. You never know who you're going to meet or the friends you're going to make. Now go out and enjoy recreation of your own.